Well, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to join this uh, august group of authors to discuss Change for America. Uh, my name is Jim Lyons, and I'm joined by Bracken Hendricks. And um, we will address um, both the issues of climate change and green jobs in 10 minutes. Remarkable feat. Um, for my part, I'm, um, I'm going to try and uh, offer some summary comments with regard to the issue of climate change um, and uh, make five essential points highlighted by various authors uh, from uh, Change for America. Um, <clears throat> so that means I have about one minute for each item, and I've already eaten up 30 seconds, so I'm going to get rolling. First, uh, I want to emphasize um, that climate change is one of those issues that is w what I would characterize as a change driver, so to speak. It, it really has implications for the U.S. economy, for energy independence, for national security, for jobs, uh, for human health, and therefore health care and health care costs, and, of course, for the environment. Um, and as such, it's a cross-sectoral issue. It affects a number of departments and agencies and really requires direction and leadership from the President and the White House. So I, I'd like to uh, attempt to acknowledge all the authors who address the issue of climate change, but there are probably too many to list. Uh, in fact, um, uh, since it is a cross-sectoral issue, many of the authors dealt in some way, shape, or form with this issue in, in the context of their chapters. Now, um, to, to my four additional points, uh, I'm going to briefly touch on um, issues associated with national legislation. Uh, international negotiations around climate change, uh, connections to the new green economy. Um, Bracken will talk about green jobs. I'm going to talk just briefly about new income streams for rural America. And then recommendations for structuring uh, the Obama administration, a new administration, now obviously the Obama administration, to manage the global climate crisis. First, with regard to national legislation, I think we saw a dress rehearsal on climate legislation in the Senate last year. Um, and now we've seen new legislation introduced uh, by Chairman Dingell and uh, proposals floated by Chairman Waxman and Chairman Markey. Uh, there was, in fact, a report today uh, that um, uh, Subcommittee Chairman Rick Boucher indicated that he understood that uh, climate, le climate change legislation, excuse me, would be next after the economy in, in terms of uh, President-elect Obama's priorities. Now, I, I can't speak to that, but... Uh, I wouldn't make this note. I, I think it's it's interesting and important to, to re recognize that um, uh, in many respects, um, dealing with climate change in the United States would create a new economy, if you will. Uh, carbon credits representing a new currency, a carbon currency that could be the source of revenue for many public and private endeavors. So um, just the artificial distinction between dealing with the economy and, and, um, and then dealing with climate change, I think, creates a false dichotomy that the authors of, of um, Change for America, I think, would, would take issue with. Um, important elements of the legislation would include the following, establishing a cap-and-trade system for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is important because it establishes a, a value for carbon, and therefore, with value, it can be marketed. Uh, it, was, it is also important because it would set a very clear bar for emission reduction targets. So everyone understands what's expected within different sectors of the economy. Um, it would also, uh, legislation needs to create base emission reduction goals that are based on sound science. Now, we've gone through um, many years of debate about uh, issues like uh, uh, voodoo economics and fuzzy math, some of my favorite concepts. In the, in the Bush administration, we saw a new concept. Uh, it wasn't science. It was called political science. And that is we had science that satisfied the policy goals and objectives of the administration at any point in time. What's essential and is emphasized by many of the authors in this book, particularly Carol Browner in a chapter on EPA, is um, the essential need for science to serve as the underpinning for strategy to deal with climate change and to establish the sideboards and the guidelines uh, for moving forward with new and effective policies. Uh, it's also important that the legislation establish a means for understanding and dealing with the consequences of climate change. Uh, there are consequences for agriculture. Um, obviously, there are energy implications and energy costs. There are consequences and implications for uh, how we build uh, new design standards. There are consequences for human health. It's essential to incorporate uh, provisions for adaptation to uh, climate's consequences, uh, be they domestic or, uh, some would argue, international in the context of climate legislation. 
And finally, the legislation must deal with both developed and developing country emissions. Primarily, the focus there is on China, which now exceeds the U.S. in terms of total emissions, and promote new pathways for low carbon development, particularly with regard to developing nations. On to the second issue, international negotiations. Um, um, there's an ongoing dialogue uh, seeking to establish new guidelines for a post-2012 uh, uh, climate change regime. The Bush administration has been viewed um, more as an impediment to progress in this regard as opposed to a partner. In fact, at the Bali talks uh, last year, U.S. Representative uh, Dobryansky first rejected the consensus that had come after f uh, 14 days of negotiations and, um, and then was um, uh, reprimanded, if you will, by uh, Kevin Conrad, who was representing Papua New Guinea. He stood up, actually, at the Bali talks and said, quote, uh, we ask for your leadership. Uh, he was speaking to uh, Representative Dobryansky. We seek your leadership, but if for some reason you're not willing to lead, leave it to the rest of us. Please get out of the way. Um, Mrs. Dobryansky then was forced to respond to a chorus of criticisms and reversed her position and said, in fact, we'll join the consensus. An Obama administration um, needs to participate fully in uh, international negotiations and, um, and reaffirming U.S. engagement in this issue, and in so doing, reestablishing global leadership, not only with regard to our role in the environment climate change, but also with regard to matters um, uh, of diplomacy in general. Climate change, in essence, provides a unique opportunity to demonstrate leadership and a willingness to, re to reengage. And in fact, um, the upcoming um, meeting of the Conference of Parties in Posen and Poland in December provides a unique opportunity to send an initial signal there. It's been recognized by a number of authors in, um, in the book and, um, and have encouraged um, the, uh, President-elect Obama to send a high-level envoy to make uh, his interest in this issue known. With regard to connections to the gr new green economy, the third point I want to make, and again, Bracken will deal with this in, in uh, much greater detail, I want to point briefly to the other economic opportunities that are driven by concern for climate change and the need to refocus our energy future on alternative clean energy solutions. In fact, um, tackling climate change and building a new green economy can generate new sources of employment, um, new sources of revenue, and could potentially finance um, new uh, opportunities for reinvestment in urban and rural America. For example, um, one author noted uh, at USDA um, that the Obama administration could develop a homegrown energy initiative, and under such an initiative, farmers could grow energy from corn and soybeans today, and potentially from crop residues and waste, uh, both animal and plant waste, um, uh, uh, from cellulosic ethanol in the future could, on the same acres, plant windmills, if you will, which, once connected to the grid, could provide energy for rural and, um, and more remote communities, um, as well as p potentially contribute to um, energy needs of urban America, and could also harvest dead and dying forests for fuel production and reduce wildfire risks across um, many millions of acres in the West. Then, um, using this new carbon currency uh, with offsets from a, a, a new carbon market, farmers could grow carbon through changes in cropping practices or by planting trees and other vegetation um, in certain areas. In fact, the National Farmers Union has initiated a program that's generated $8 million for farmers engaged in producing carbon, in essence growing carbon and, and, um, and, and uh, establishing or, or gaining a value for that carbon on the existing carbon exchange. At the same time, uh, depending on the way these acres are planted, um, those same lands could improve water quality and biodiversity and, uh, and uh, might also provide another means of compensation for those so-called ecological services. Um, so in essence, uh, dealing with climate change creates a new opportunity uh, for new sources of revenue for American agriculture beyond the food and fiber that is normally associated with agricultural production across uh, most of America. Now to my final point about organizing to lead on climate and, um, and the new green economy, uh, I can't help but note as a former Clinton official that uh, while we were in office, oftentimes we heard the refrain, um, <clears throat> it's the economy or the environment. I can't tell you how many times I heard that. Well, I think um, as demonstrated by many of the authors um, in, in this uh, book, 
um, it's clear that it is the economy and the environment that will benefit from reinvestment in new investment in a new green economy and efforts to try and uh, address climate change. Um, authors suggest various structures and strategies to reassert U.S. leadership on climate change. First, uh, Todd Stern and David Hayes recommend in their chapter the creation of a new National Energy Council. It would bring together uh, the National Security Council, the Economic Council, CEQ, uh, the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy, um, and um, most cabinet-level officials. Um, and um, this office would then, quote, drive policy and strategic options for the president with respect to energy and climate change. Uh, Ron Minsk and L.G. Holstein, um, in addressing challenges at the Department of Energy, suggested uh, the need to create a new comprehensive energy plan. Actually, um, it would be the first energy plan, so I guess it wouldn't be new, um, for the nation as a whole, and to do so within 60 days of um, the administration taking office, with a unifying theme, uh, quote, to focus on policies to regulate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, Carol Browner suggests that on day one of the new administration, the president should explicitly direct EPA to review how best to reduce greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, increase energy efficiency, and expand alternative energy sources. And then she goes on to also recommend that the, that, that the president reconsider the EPA denial of the California waiver of the Clean Air Act uh, for more fuel efficient cars. So. Um, much to address, um, uh, an issue and a subject matter that has broad implications for the new administration, provides unique opportunities to fill a void that has been created in the past eight years by the Bush administration and filled by many states taking new initiatives to deal with climate and, and energy alternatives. This provides, this issue provides an opportunity for the new administration to step back up to the plate and really become a partner with the states in, in leading a new direction for both dealing with climate issues but also uh, for growing a new green economy. And with that, I'll turn uh, things over to, to Bracken. Great. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, thank you for, for coming out and for your, uh, your interest in this conversation about how we transition into a new government and how we uh, bring change. Um, to uh, the American government and to our, our democracy. Clearly, climate change and energy and environmental issues have taken uh, a, a fundamentally different role in our conversation about the future of the country uh, than they had for many years. With the, the uh, rising up of climate and energy policy as a centerpiece of the environmental agenda, it's really ordered the priorities of the environmental movement around something that's quite different from the history of the last 30 years. And uh, a conversation about something uh, called the new energy economy, as Jim was just saying, um, starts to reframe the issue very, very fundamentally. So I'm here to talk about green jobs and how the solutions to global warming can be fundamental to the current economic position that we're in. Um, and I think this is very unusual for advocates around um, the environmental movement, advocates around environmental systemic health to be thinking and talking in terms of economic development. But it creates some very, very interesting and important opportunities uh, to rethink uh, how we address environmental issues broadly. Fundamentally, if I can sort of offer one point, and this was sort of central in our framing of the whole discussion on climate change, it is that energy and climate issues are core economic issues and that solving global warming will mean substantial economic investment into the core productivity and competitiveness of the American economy. Uh, and this has very fundamental impacts on how we manage these, in these issues within the federal government. Um, to just get a brief uh, sense of the pr of perspective on global warming and its economic impact, it's important also to look first at climate impacts and the negative side, the, the scale and the scope and the speed of the movement of climate change, global warming as an economic issue. It's estimated that by the end of the century, it will cost the U.S. economy, if nothing is done to address it, $1.9 trillion annually. This is the impact of storms, of, of droughts, of fires. Um, 
and there are fundamentally uh, there are very, very significant impacts that will take place globally as well with the increasing uh, spread of energy poverty. Those people who, millions of people who every day lack access to the basic economic resources to maintain a decent standard of living. Um, the, s the changes in global energy prices have wiped out 10 years of very, very serious work on debt relief. Um, and the impacts on the developing world from this phenomenon of, of global energy poverty uh, are very difficult to overstate. Further, as we um, uh, anticipate the impacts of global warming, um, the, the, the fundamental impacts will be borne worst uh, and first by those with the least access to resources, the least ability to adapt. So if we think of global warming as an economic issue, as a major social disruption, the costs are tremendous. But one of the exciting opportunities with the shift to a discussion around green jobs is that people are starting to understand the, the scope and the scale of the potential of this positive investment as well. Building the solutions to global warming means fundamentally investing in our energy infrastructure, the infrastructure of our cities, economic development opportunities for our rural communities, and it starts to touch a whole host of um, agencies and federal programs and, uh, and parts of the government that engage directly with economic issues that haven't traditionally thought of energy and environmental issues as their purview. But suddenly we see that as if we're trying to seriously build a clean energy economy, it means a very profound shift in the way we manage resources across the government. We spend uh, trillions of dollars throughout the economy, uh, you know, year after year, we are building the, the, the foundation of our economic productivity, but we're building it in a way that's not driving the sorts of uh, the economic outcomes, the sorts of environmental outcomes that we need to see. So when we, when we look at the opportunities for the next administration in structuring a government, um, we see that there's a tremendous opportunity for leadership using the lens of uh, uh, building a clean energy economy to rethink how we are organizing agencies and, and the work of agencies, how we are organizing relationships with Congress, uh, and very fundamentally how we are positioning the United States for leadership in the world. Um, looking across agencies, there will be um, very, very significant opportunities for the next president to think about the management of these fundamental economic considerations across agencies. Uh, there was already some mention of the creation of a National Energy Council. The notion of elevating the solutions to global warming and our national response, both domestically and internationally, um, to a White House level position makes a tremendous amount of sense when you think about the types of impacts that this will have on how HUD agency budgets are spent, on helping cities to rebuild their infrastructure, to engage in energy efficiency retrofits block by block, to support affordable housing that starts to create markets for green investments and green building. If we think about agencies like FERC that are going to have oversight over the siting and the development of a national electrical grid infrastructure infrastructure and how we're going to rapidly accelerate that to build a clean energy infrastructure that can, that can uh, allow for the accelerated development of renewable energy in rural, remote locations with large-scale wind farms and bring it to the areas of the nation that, that have uh, severe constraints with access to, uh, to reliable sources of energy. Um, agencies like um, Department of, en uh, Department of Energy, Department of Environment have had a long-standing traditional role, but it will spread really throughout the government and some sort of leadership role with a, a direct report to the president and, and a serious coordinating role in the ability to shape the way budgets are, are deployed, the way economic development tools impact manufacturing jobs, uh, minority business development, uh, local rural economic development. There's so many ways that the solutions to climate change are creating some of the fastest growing markets and some of the fastest growing opportunities for the United States to reposition itself for competitiveness in terms of capturing these emerging global markets. Um, Within the executive branch, the president will also have a tremendous opportunity uh, within his own agency, within, uh, within the office of the White House, through CEQ, to think about how uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, is, is administered. There's an opportunity to look at siting of federal projects to incorporate the impacts of carbon emissions and climate change, and a whole host of ways where administrative processes will have tremendous impact on the way we grow, the way we develop. Um, 
and there will be an opportunity to simply use the convening power of the presidency, the, the ability to call the nation to a higher challenge. Clearly through this election we've seen the important role that leadership is playing uh, in galvanizing the, the, the political will, the popular will of the American people. And we're seeing new constituencies from faith to poverty uh, to rural constituencies to uh, traditional business industries that have long seen environmental issues as a, a burdensome regulatory overlay and they're suddenly seeing seeing it as an opportunity to create new markets and to engage with the world differently. Um, so simply using the bully pulpit of major uh, announcements, major uh, speeches, State of the Union addresses, uh, inaugural addresses, these sorts of things are an opportunity to focus the nation in a new way and a new opportunity for leadership uh, for a new administration. And lastly, I just want to point at the way that this is cutting across um, sort of social policy in some very interesting ways. There's an opportunity to have a galvanizing conversation on green jobs and how you can create work in manufacturing and construction uh, by retrofitting our cities and engaging service uh, through, through the, um, the Serve for America, through, through youth build. Um, create pathways out of poverty for some of the some of the most difficult to to reach and employ people to gain a foothold in these emerging new jobs uh, building a clean energy economy we have the opportunity here not only to minimize the pain of global warming but to to maximize the gain and the the opportunity to create broader access to these opportunities. Uh, we put forward in the book the notion that a clean energy core that captured the imagination of young people, that created service opportunities, workforce investment, training, that engaged manufacturing businesses and construction opportunities would have a very, very significant uh, window of opportunity during this economic crisis um, as, as a sort of a signature initiative. And it, it would be exciting to see something like that move. Uh, looking at the legislative uh, opportunities, they are very significant as well and they extend well beyond the traditional conversation that we've had around passing a cap and trade piece of legislation, around passing a climate bill. Certainly moving climate legislation will be a centerpiece of our approach to dealing with carbon emissions and helping to transition the economy so that we can begin to internalize the greatest market failure uh, that we've really ever seen, which is the carbon emissions. It's fundamentally a failure in the market to account for the true costs of our economic productivity. Um, but moving beyond a cap and trade legislation, which we hope will move rapidly in a, in a new administration um, and in relation to a new Congress, there's also a tremendous opportunity with the recovery package. Uh, the Center for American Progress has put forward um, in part in the context of this, uh, this book, but also in our broader work, the notion of a green economic recovery and a green economic stimulus. And once you have laid down a long-term economic vision built on the foundation of a green economy, there are many, many things that can be done very uh, immediately in the short term to invest in clean energy, from transit systems to workforce investment uh, to retrofitting buildings and helping to manufacture wind turbines and solar panels. And there's a tremendous opportunity to invest. There's also a host of complementary policies that may not be directly driven by a uh, cap and trade system, but around energy efficiency portfolio standards, renewable portfolio standards, uh, retooling the auto industry. We're seeing climate change enter into the whole conversation about the competitiveness of our uh, automobile industry and, and, and really the, the long-term competitiveness of American manufacturing broadly. Um, in all of these economic policies, there's an opportunity to position ourselves for greater long-term job creation, economic stimulus, long-term economic growth, uh, and greater engagement with the world uh, economy in a, in a way that, that is much more competitive by responding to the market signals that we're getting from global warming. Uh, and lastly, in closing, let me just say that the next president is also going to have opportunities to promote green jobs through, the, uh, through engaging the, uh, the global debate around climate change. Uh, this will be a profound opportunity for a new president to assert a, a new role of, of engagement internationally, a new role of collaboration to, to tackle some of the deepest problems. Climate change is really, I think, a, a lightning rod for the global community of how the uh, United States has turned its back on global engagement over the last eight years. And this is an opportunity to define a different set of relationships. But similarly, as we have begun to see the uh, opportunities to track climate 
and carbon regulation back through to economic competitiveness, investment, and growth. Similarly, around issues of the developing world, uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to help the Global South leapfrog very, very destructive patterns of global, global development um, that have held them back. Uh, to help them address uh, energy poverty by investing in new energy systems, new infrastructure that allow them to bypass some of the most destructive pieces of, um, of, of the Industrial Revolution and, and use information technology, distributed energy systems, and a whole host of technologies that were invented uh, in the United States uh, and that we can actually use as global exports, but in a way that promotes uh, uplift, that promotes economic opportunity, not only in this country, but uh, in a global development context. Um, and I guess within that context, there's also an opportunity to rethink how we engage trade and its impacts on American business as well. So there's, an, there's a very restorative agenda as we start to think of climate change as a driver for economic growth and engagement. Um, and I think we can talk about some more of these issues as we, as we open this up to conversation. Um, in closing, I think the fundamental realization uh, and the fundamental verdict of, of the election is that we can't drill or burn our way out of our current environmental uh, crises, our current global economic or climate crisis. Uh, we have to invest and invent our way out of these problems. Uh, and it is the notion that solving global warming can renew America's commitment to investing in our cities, in our people, in the skills of our workers, and the productivity of our infrastructure that really links to the current mood of hope uh, and a desire to see new levels of investment and engagement with, with the fundamental productivity of our economy. Uh, and I think green jobs, more than anything else, really signals this transition in the American thinking. Great. Oops, we'll open it up for questions. Good afternoon. My name is Kessie Stribling. I'm the publisher of The Strategist magazine. I think that you have laid out some pretty concrete and strategic approaches to dealing with climate change and engaging uh, green jobs on, on a national level. I wonder if you could offer maybe one or two strategies that the incoming administration can use to get local governments to get on board with the effort so that they can see the benefit of adding green jobs or um, undergoing initiatives to help combat uh, climate change? Sure. Um, I would just uh, push back on one premise of, of, your, uh, of your question. I think local governments are already on board. I think local governments, uh, states and cities have been leading the way. Um, in the absence of a strong, coherent national vision for solving global warming, for taking on the, the, our most uh, deeply entrenched energy and environmental problems, um, it has been community-based leadership that really has started to, to create the opportunity for this conversation. The whole concept of green jobs comes out of uh, urban social justice advocates recognizing that there were very, very large new flows of capital that potentially can move. It's estimated that a, an auction of carbon emission permits would be worth between 50 and $300 billion annually. This is a very, very significant new flow of capital. Uh, what the opportunity is for the federal government is to see this opportunity and start doing things that start to rebuild our communities, both urban and rural communities, investing in uh, the integration of broadband infrastructure with our electricity grid. That will drive a tremendous amount of new skilled job creation and investment into the community level. I think uh, mayors and cities and, uh, and state governments as well are, are hungry for this sort of investment. They're trying using their own regulatory and economic development tools to uh, pioneer these solutions. And now the federal government has a tremendous opportunity to learn from the laboratory that's already gone on in the states to apply some of these best practices. Uh, and I think we can see a very, very rapid uh, flourishing of, of exciting new s policy solutions across the federal government as a result of the leadership that local governments have shown. Very good. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. It's George Gould with uh, Gould Associates. I could you help us a little, help me maybe a little bit on the green jobs uh, concept. How are you going to deal with jobs that have been defined by some of the environmental community as doing work, frankly, that is 
anti-green, if you will. How, how, we, how are you going to be dealing with that? Are those people going to be transferred to new jobs? Are you going to change the work that they're doing? I'm thinking of construction. I'm thinking about lawn, uh, farming, some of those areas. Maybe I'll just – well, <coughs> I'll, address, uh, I'll address the question from the standpoint of at least rural economy. Um, I think what you'd find is that the opportunities for investing in um, alternative energy, for example, present – uh, tremendous opportunities for reinvestment in rural economies and new job opportunities. Wind farms is an example that's been mentioned. Um, um, solar um, uh, energy production requiring new investments in, in the grid, new access to the grid system so that energy can be transmitted to, um, to other places for use um, represent opportunities for uh, a new skilled workforce uh, and a tremendous opportunity for growth, I think, in, um, in employment. In, in these particular sectors, and there are many others. Bracken uh, speaks often, and I'll let him address this, about the opportunities for reinvestment in, uh, in urban America, um, retrofitting buildings to increase energy efficiency, um, green roofs. Um, the city of Chicago, for example, um, City Hall has a green roof as an example, and it started a movement in the United States that's expanded to include New York, Seattle, San Francisco, and elsewhere. Um, in fact, uh, the, the first green roof on a building in Washington, D.C. was built by a number of um, uh, students uh, from, um, um, from communities in Anacostia uh, through, a, through a work program, a service program uh, that provided them training. And frankly, now the demand for their, for their services out, outweighs the number of students that are available. So there are tremendous opportunities for this reinvestment. But Bracken, do you want to comment Yeah, I more? just want to add that um, – I think there's a misconception that uh, green jobs are going to be sort of esoteric new niche jobs, you know, installing solar panels, that they're, that they're you know, on the fringe of new technologies being moved into, into large-scale deployment. They are that. That's a, a significant piece. Um, but they are also uh, familiar jobs in familiar industries. We're talking about green as a new and growing sector of the economy. And so when we talk about a green job, we're really talking about jobs for plumbers and pipe fitters, for insulators, for electrical linemen. Uh, these are very good, high-wage, high-skill, um, blue-collar jobs. They're jobs that have opportunities for entry level and, and real career ladders and skill development uh, to promote people and, and provide pathways into the middle class. And they also involve a significant investment in technical jobs around uh, engineering and architecture and design as well. Um, but I just want to point to a study that was done by McKinsey and Company uh, where they took climate solutions and they just arrayed them from the least cost to the most costly. And they found that about 40% of the immediately available jobs can be done profitably at a negative cost. Uh, and these are jobs doing things like insulating hot water heaters, testing and balancing air conditioning. They ultimately save money across the economy. So we need to think in a new way um, about green issues, green solutions as an opportunity just to fundamentally invest in the productivity of our infrastructure, uh, in the vibrancy of our communities, and to put people back to work at a time when we've lost about 800,000 jobs in the construction sector in the last, uh, in the last year, um, when we're seeing credit markets tighten. This is an opportunity to, put, to create new access to capital and new investment in communities that's going to drive a broad-based economic recovery. I guess we have time maybe for one more question, and then we really should uh, turn it back over to, to Mark and Michelle and, and uh, let them close out and thank them for their leadership in pulling this together. Is there any, one more question? Oh, wait, Hold wait, on, wait, wait, just wait for the microphone if you would, please. Uh, my my name's Sam, um, and I'm affiliated with a bunch of different groups around town and worked with the center, I've worked with the mine workers. Um, so I have a question kind of thinking about training uh, people for green collar jobs. Um, you know, in, in with the clean, uh, and I'm thinking also of like training the, the anti-green job work folks. Uh, in, it, with the Clean Air Act, there was there were some proposals, Senator Byrd and others had proposals to, um, to provide not just uh, retraining, but education stipends and income replacement, sort of a more robust uh, package for people who are going to be most directly affected, like you know, coal mine, coal miners, and and coal-fired electric power utility workers. 
uh, have you thought more about the role that that type of more robust pack, you know, in addition just to retraining? Because I think people have a very low opinion of trade adjustment assistance, and I mean, obviously, the participation and uptake in those programs has been low. So, have you thought about kind of fleshing out the the retraining, either of you, um, that would be available for those that would be most directly affected in those sort of core, car, uh, you know, fossil industries in, in the U.S. What I would offer in response is I think that reflects kind of old thinking about about the investment opportunities that exist, as, as we've already alluded to. Um, many of the jobs that are associated with the new green economy are those same basic jobs applied to different outcomes, different products, to uh, to really in, invest in, in new opportunities. And so, um, you know, the presumption that this means that um, you know workers uh, have to be retrained. Uh, in a totally different field, I think is a false assumption. And in many instances, the same skills will apply. And so the, the reinvestment I is really needed to catalyze opportunities for them to go back to work um, and to apply the same skills, but to producing, um, say, energy efficient systems, to re retrofitting buildings. I mean, the same people who are doing the pipe fitting work um, in, a, in a standard building today um, with a different set of design standards could be um, putting in the piping and and the plumbing for a much more ener energy efficient building. And if the incentives are there, if the resources are there, that will ensure that the jobs, in fact, will be there. And I, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, the whole conversation from moving uh, to, to a conversation about investment and looking at resource streams is really important. We are talking about creating opportunities for uh, auto workers to continue making cars, but to make cars that uh, use vastly less oil and produce less pollution. The conversation on carbon capture and sequestration is actually a, a path forward for traditional utility workers and mine workers uh, that otherwise would face uh, very, very serious constraints if we do nothing about global warming. So a very fundamental piece of this agenda is about reducing the pain, reducing the dislocation caused by addressing these impacts by doing it systematically in a way that helps workers make these transitions. And in this conversation, there really are very significant resources on the table. And in those cases where there are real economic impacts, whether it's changing electricity prices on, on low-income rate payers or, uh, or resource-dependent industries that may really experience real impacts, um, there is an obligation to dedicate serious resources to taking those impacts into account. If we don't have a strategy to address this, we'll never be able to take that on and offer the, the supports and the resources. And this is really ultimately about taking care of that. CAP has a program that puts 50% uh, of the proceeds from, a, from an auction in cap and trade directly into equity impacts and making sure that, that, uh, that low-income folks and that impacted workers are uh, taken seriously in this solution. But I think if we address it proactively, we can uh, make sure those impacts are, are as small as humanly possible. Great. Mark, Michelle, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, we very much appreciate your participation. And thank you again to all of our authors. Just wanted to say one last time, our part of the book today is available on um, AmericanProgressAction.org. You can um, download some chapters for free there. And then it will be available in bookstores in January, being published by Basic Books. Mark? Uh, um, a big thanks to all our panelists, all our contributors, uh, Michelle and her team. I will say over a year ago when we started, one potential um, contributor said, sounds great, but we really want you to, to also create a bank of names who could populate a new administration. This was the easiest decision I never brought to you. And I told this person, A, it would overwhelm us, and B, we had no political or moral standing to do that. Policy is different. A good idea can and has come from anywhere. And our assumption was twofold. First, uh, uh, was, was, one, was one really. Any plausible candidate has to focus more on uh, primaries, money, and media than what they may do to the FTC in a year and a half. We had the luxury of not worrying about money and primaries and media, but could look ahead to policy in the short and long term for two goals. One, any ideas that we have that could enrich and help a new administration and two, to be, uh, that a new administration could be measured against. So we hoped and hope to be a catalyst and a benchmark. And so Change for America will uh, endure over time because of the qualities and ideas of these 60-plus scholars who
people have contributed to this uh, collective effort. And Basic Books will have a print version uh, January 5th, 2009 in bookstores and shortly a ebook version. If you want to bother them and email them, they will let you know within a few days when the ebook uh, version uh, would be purchased, could be purchased. Thank you very much. Thank you.